Tonight, a deadly tragedy at a Quebec mountain resort with two people thrown from a gondola high above the ground. At the force of the impact, two persons were projected outside of the gondola. Questions about how it could have happened. The life of another young firefighter taken as Canada's wildfire season hits an unprecedented milestone. Every one of the territories will be mourning the loss of this firefighter. Facing prosecution and legal troubles, Pakistan's former prime minister speaks out. I think that within the next two weeks, I expect to be behind bars. Why Imran Khan says Canada should be paying attention. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. One person is dead and another in critical condition tonight after an accident involving a gondola at Mont Tremblant, Quebec. Just an hour and a half drive north of Montreal, Mont Tremblant is a popular destination, best known as a world class ski resort. And this time of year, it's a place for shopping, festivals, and dramatic views from its gondolas. But tonight is the scene of a tragedy. Sarah Levitt now on what we know about what happened and the many questions that are unanswered. A popular tourist destination in both summer and winter, Mont Tremblant's panoramic gondolas are a draw for many. Today, though, a terrifying tragedy. One person is dead, another in critical condition. Emergency services were dispatched here uh, concerning a collision between a vehicle and a gondola. It was a construction vehicle. And at the force of the impact, two persons were projected outside of the gondola. Depending on where the gondola was, they could have fallen anywhere from 10 to 40 meters. But what is clear is that they hit the ground very hard. Every day, hundreds to thousands of people come to take in the sights. This weekend was especially popular because Mont Tremblant was hosting the International Blues Festival. The gondolas carry visitors to the top with breathtaking views on the way. What's unclear is how this collision could even happen. Police say it took place about halfway between the base of the mountain and the summit. Almost immediately, the gondolas were evacuated. Provincial police also cut off access to the mountain. At the base, crowds quickly thinned out. A spokesperson for the resort said nothing like this has ever happened before. They offer sympathies to the family. It's a very difficult day for us because it's such a hard ship and a hard day. We canceled the blues festival that was happening on the mountain today. And we also closed our activities by respect to the family. So, Sarah, this evening, still not a lot of basic information of, of what happened. And, Ian, lots of people stopping me tonight asking me just how on earth this could happen. So far, uh, Mont Tremblant officials and the police are not saying a lot. They won't say what construction was ongoing or what vehicle uh, hit the gondola. There's also a question of just how two people were able to be ejected from the gondola. Uh, before departure, the doors are, are checked to make sure that they're locked and the windows themselves don't open. Police, though, they say all those questions should be answered as this investigation continues. And I know you'll stay on the story. Sarah Levitt in Mont Tremblant, Quebec. Turning now to Canada's ongoing wildfire crisis as this season shatters a decades-old record. Wildfire management officials now say 10 million hectares have burned this year. That's an area roughly twice the size of Nova Scotia. And over 2 million hectares more than the previous record set back in 1989. And this wildfire season is still far from over. Roughly 900 fires are burning across the country. Over half are out of control with Western Canada seeing the worst of it, especially B.C., now battling close to 400 fires. There are over 100 active fires in Alberta and roughly 90 in the Northwest Territories where a firefighter has been killed. Canada's second frontline fatality in the past few days. Georgie Smythe has that tonight. In the middle of an already destructive wildfire season, another death on the front line. Every one of the territories will be mourning the loss of this firefighter. Officials say the male firefighter who has not been identified died from an injury on Saturday while battling a fire in the Fort Liard district near the territory's borders with Yukon and BC. Uh, the firefighters up here do an amazing job. They work really hard and they work really closely. And a lot of them, they're working in their own communities or in territories that are really important to them culturally or just because they grew up here. It's Canada's second frontline fatality in the past few days after 19-year-old firefighter Devon Gale died in Revelstoke on Thursday. 
her death adding grief to exhaustion as dry weather fuels the many fires in the central interior. We need some consistent precipitation. Unfortunately, it looks like maybe starting tomorrow we're back to a bit of a, a drying tend with a bit of a different inversion and we'll get some winds, which is what we don't want to see is the winds. But if there's no water here, it means that there's no water kind of percolating gently down into our streams. Drought is also partly to blame for the ferocity of these fires. Water scarcity is being felt across BC, even in wetland and rainforest areas. Any of these things could, could ignite fairly easily, um, given a, a concerted um, source of ignition, like a lightning strike and something like that. So once they get going, there's a lot of fuel and it'll f flow up the branches up into the crown of the tree. And once it gets going and all the trees get involved, it's really hard to put it out. And so that's why fires go out of control. While BC might see some rain this week, it's unlikely to be enough to slow down the flames. But the skies might offer some help with the arrival of international firefighters. Georgie Smythe, CBC News, Vancouver. As southern Europe swelters under a relentless heat wave, there are new warnings tonight that it's going to get worse. Today, Italy issued heat warnings in 16 cities, even as experts warned that a new, powerful weather system coming in from North Africa could push temperatures to 45 degrees Celsius. And in Spain, wildfires forced 4,000 people out of their homes over the weekend. In the U.S., too, extreme weather is making life difficult, even dangerous. And it's not just the sizzling heat. Katie Simpson starts us off with deadly flooding in Pennsylvania. An urgent search for the missing in rural Pennsylvania after flash flooding washed away vehicles on a highway Saturday afternoon. In my 44 years, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, we had approximately six and a half to seven inches of rain in under 45 minutes. Rescue workers helped save a dad and his four-year-old son after their car became trapped while the family drove to a barbecue. But his wife, two-year-old daughter, nine-month-old son and their grandmother were all carried away by the flood. Unbelievable, devastating to all the families involved. We are all grieving. For days now, much of the U.S. Northeast has been pummeled by rain. Flood alerts are in effect for some 55 million people, including those in New York City. This is possibly our new normal. This is the kind of weather that even what should normally be a beautiful beach-going Sunday in July can turn into a devastating catastrophe because of Mother Nature. On the other side of the country, extreme weather poses a completely different set of challenges. Hot and dry conditions are helping fuel wildfires in Southern California, forcing the evacuation of hundreds of homes. Experts predict 100 new temperature records will have been set after a weekend of intense heat. It's hottest in Death Valley, which continues to draw tourists from around the world. Yeah, it's people that want to come to areas like Death Valley and uh, experience the extremes. They want to know what the highest temperatures feel like. Many locals across the southwest feel differently and are cooling down at every opportunity. It is miserable being outside unless you're in the water somehow. Uh, and it's actually not safe. And with temperatures expected to remain steady, there isn't much relief on the way. Katie, this extreme weather is affecting a, a wide range of daily activities across the United States. Parents in Arizona are not letting their kids play on playgrounds because the equipment gets too hot and they'll get contact burns. Outdoor work is too dangerous and in other states it has been called off because of the heat. The rainstorms in the Northeast are upending travel. More than 1,500 flights have been cancelled. Even more have been delayed. And it all points back toward one big question. Is this just what the U.S. should expect in the summer? As the governor of New York suggests, could this be the new normal? Ian. Katie Simpson, Ian Washington. The first joint actors and writers strike in six decades has brought Hollywood to a halt. Studios are shut down as workers picket. And as Travis Danrad shows us, that's having a major effect on people here in Canada, too. And due to this week's entertainment strike... At the premiere of Disney's Haunted Mansion, classic villains walk the red carpet instead of cast members. Death lurks around every corner. Stars like Danny DeVito... So deep have, sunken eyes. Like a raccoon. Owen Wilson and Tiffany Haddish... <laughs> ...are all on strike. Actors joining screenwriters who were already out. 
and the ripple effects are already reaching well beyond Hollywood. This is a Star Trek The Discovery. Girge Kapush is a Toronto-based storyboard artist helping producers and directors lay out their visions. He's worked with Apple, Netflix and Amazon. Oh, 100% of my income comes from these streaming platforms. So if this all comes to a halt and shuts down, uh, yeah, it might have to go to the food banks. Last year, it's estimated Hollywood studios and streaming companies helped boost film and television production to over $3 billion in Ontario alone. It's also ancillary economic activity, and the catering, the locations, also the Teamsters, they're also out of work. So it's a significant economic hit for Ontario and for Toronto especially. While Canadian productions are still happening, unions here are standing in solidarity with their American counterparts. No, it's not just about money. Multinational corporations using AI to produce scripts and scan and replicate actors is also at issue. What happens to my livelihood if you replace me by an AI image without my consent, without any compensation, without any guardrails in, that's absolutely wrong. It's immoral, it's unethical. While many film studios sit in wait, there's also concern about the Toronto International Film Festival, which is just about a month and a half away. If the strike drags on any longer, those usual star-studded red carpets could be left starless. Travis Stanrash, CBC News, Toronto. Days of torrential rain in South Korea have left dozens dead and thousands of people are out of their homes from flooding and landslides. This woman, one of the lucky ones, she was pulled out of a river after being swept away while crossing a bridge. But time may be running out for people trapped in a flooded tunnel. Search teams have been rushing to reach the occupants of at least 15 vehicles and a bus. At least nine bodies have been recovered so far. Rescue workers were on the scene after a wing of an apartment building collapsed near Naples. At least three people were pulled from the rubble, and officials say there were no fatalities. The building, believed to be about 200 years old, was home to more than 20 people. An investigation is underway. Israel's prime minister has been released from hospital after an overnight stay. A motorcade carrying Benjamin Netanyahu was seen leaving the hospital grounds. Doctors say he was treated for dehydration. The 73-year-old was admitted Saturday complaining of dizziness. He had been holidaying nearby during a heat wave. Here in Canada, climate change is seen as a cause of growing aggravation in Alberta. A new kind of mosquito is thriving in cities there, and it's able to survive a prairie winter. Terry Reith shows us there's a health risk beyond the discomfort. On a summer day, it's great to play until the mosquitoes come out. They're just the worst. They're like everywhere, especially in like the grass and stuff. I'm like walking through fields, just biting me all over and it gets so itchy. I hate them. If there's a mass extinction on the planet, I would beg it to be mosquitoes. They're a nightmare. Now, one more reason to loathe the creatures. A so-called urban mosquito named Culex pipians one that carries the West Nile virus. What we're seeing here is Culex pipians in every level of development. They breed quickly. They thrive in cities, and all it takes is a bit of standing water, a catch basin, bird bath, even a puddle to create multiple generations. I will say we have been surprised at the scope of how well Culex pipians is thriving in, this, in, in our city and in this new environment. So we are gearing up to, you know, we're trying to get the message out because it really is something new. The breed first arrived in southern Ontario in 2001 and the first West Nile virus cases in humans were seen a year later. These are the invasive mosquitoes we've been talking about. Experts say it's now proven it can survive a prairie winter. It's able to colonize human habitats extremely well because it can use our homes as overwintering sites so it can survive cold winters. Um, it's invasive because it's not from this area and it spreads very rapidly when it gets into new habitats. West Nile virus is generally mild, but can cause severe neurological problems. The virus can also affect pets and horses. But I do think that there's a growing realization that with climate change and with the number of invasive mosquitoes in Canada rising, that this is going to be a problem that isn't going away and we need to start addressing it. One more reason to avoid mosquitoes, and when you can't, use bug spray.
Terry Reith, CBC News, Edmonton. Another person has died as a result of that deadly bus crash near Carberry, Manitoba last month. The RCMP says a 79-year-old woman who is in hospital has now died of her injuries, and that brings the total number of deaths to 17. The crash happened when a semi-trailer truck collided with a minibus carrying seniors on a day trip to a casino. Most of the victims were from in and around the city of Dauphin, Manitoba. Canadians almost everywhere have been affected by wildfires this summer, and people who fight them can face long-term consequences, including a diagnosis of cancer. But the workplace compensation varies greatly by province. As Kate McKenna explains, a new federal law could be the first step to change that. As fires burn across Canada, firefighters answer the call for help. Now a new law seeks to make sure we're protecting those who protect us. Thanks in part to this man, a firefighter diagnosed with incurable cancer. I'm living with that and I was thinking, what can I do to help other people? Because His issue is workplace compensation for cancer. For firefighters, it varies significantly by province. Quebec only automatically covers nine types of cancer. Alberta covers 20. If you fight a fire in British Columbia, in Ontario, in uh, Halifax, it's still a fire. So the dangers are the same. So every, every fireman should be covered the same. He told so this Quebec fire member fire of parliament. And that's when I started looking into it and um, realized that there really was a huge discrepancy across provinces. Yes, poor, 322, 322. Nays, contre, zero, aucun. I declare the motion carried. She championed a bill hoping to change that. It passed into law a few weeks ago. To have this inequity of coverage uh, for firefighters when they get diagnosed with those illnesses associated with those carcinogens um, is a real disservice, you know, to those that, you know, serve the community. It'll create a national framework. Provinces and experts will sit down to share their research so everyone has access to the same information. If the provinces recognize those cancers and then during their treatment they can get the support and God forbid um, if they succumb to their, their cancer, the federal grant, the memorial grant that we brought in in 2018 would allow the families of those fallen uh, firefighters to receive the grant. Change is not guaranteed. Provinces decide which cancers they'll cover, but experts say it's an important first step. In Canada, 95% of our line of duty deaths are attributable to cancer. Everyone involved with this law says that they hope that it leads to real change. Both the provinces of Quebec and New Brunswick say that they're open to adding more types of cancer to their coverage. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Ottawa. Around the world tonight, fans are remembering Jane Birkin, an actress and singer who lit up the 1960s and 70s. She was born in Britain but made her name alongside French star Serge Gainsbourg, her partner of 13 years. They were part of an international wave that was changing cinema and music. She also inspired the iconic Birkin bag by the fashion house Hermes. Jane Birkin died in her Paris apartment at the age of 76. Pakistan's former prime minister is accusing the current administration of a politically motivated vendetta. The whole idea is that I should be in jail uh, when the election uh, start. Why Imran Khan says he's being targeted. But first, conquering a tennis icon. The big upset taking center stage at the Wimbledon final. And... The North American Indigenous Games kick off in Nova Scotia. I feel very, very proud to be able to represent generations past. Why the games mean so much to so many. We're back in two. Extraordinary. Spain's Carlos Alcaraz has won at Wimbledon, defeating longtime Serbian champ Novak Djokovic, who lost his bid for a fifth straight Wimbledon title. At just 20 years old, Alcaraz is the third youngest player to ever win the Grand Slam event. The trophy was presented by Princess Kate on the court.
It's a wrap for this year's Calgary Stampede. 2023 saw the second highest attendance in the festival's history, with over 1.2 million people there to see the rodeo, enjoy specialty foods, and live music. Organizers say they're finally starting to bounce back after some difficult years during the pandemic. Thousands of athletes from all corners of the continent have gathered in Halifax tonight to share cultures and to celebrate. It is the opening ceremony for the North American Indigenous Games. The athletic and cultural event brings together more than 750 Indigenous nations. Brett Ruskin shows us what we can expect from the Games. The biggest multi-sport event ever to come to Atlantic Canada is now underway. 5,000 teenage athletes will compete this week in 16 sports. One of them is 3D archery. This weekend, archery officials prepared the venue. Does that say 18 on it, guys? Unlike the Olympics, with a set target at a set distance, no. this event has targets of different shapes and locations, all kept secret until the athletes arrive down the trail. There's things in a way, like a brook and trees and different thickness of trees. These, these all factor into your brain and try to guess what the yardage is, right? Sometimes you look at a big animal that's there and you'll be like, that's 27 yards and it turns out to be 34 and you missed a 10. <laughs> so you get a 5 points instead of 11 or 10. It's one of three traditional events with competitors coming from all across North America. For me, it's just seeing all of these beautiful young people, these 13 to 19 year olds who are coming from not just Mi'kma'ki, but from all across Turtle Island, from as far away as California, Florida, Nunavut and Yukon. Representing Team Ontario is Victoria Bergeron. I feel very, very proud to be able to represent generations past that never had these opportunities. This will be the 10th edition of the North American Indigenous Games. The last time the Games were held was six years ago in Toronto. And I think everyone in like my volunteer meetings, everyone seems really pumped. They're so excited to host this, to, all, to welcome all these people uh, to uh, Mi'kma'ki. And right in the middle of things, this cultural village has now been set up, showcasing artisans, food, and music. The first athletic events are set to start tomorrow morning. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Halifax. One of Pakistan's most prominent politicians is accusing the country's ruling government of political interference. We have no democracy now. We have an undeclared martial law. Why Imran Khan says nearly 200 court cases have been filed against him. Plus, inside the NATO mission to monitor the war in Ukraine. They're fighting back and they're taking control of the country they love. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. figures in Pakistan loom as large or prompt more debate than Imran Khan. The former cricket star with a playboy reputation turned populist politician whose rallies could draw hundreds of thousands. After becoming prime minister in 2018, a dispute with the military and economic anger triggered a no confidence vote that forced him out of office in 2022. The resolution for vote of no confidence against Mr. Imran Khan. That unleashed a political crisis and sometimes violent protest. Blaming a foreign conspiracy, Khan rallied his base in an attempt to return to power, dividing his country even further. And now, facing a growing list of criminal charges and possible jail time, he's speaking out, declaring his innocence. And former Prime Minister Imran Khan joins us now from Lahore, Pakistan. Thank you very much for doing this. My pleasure. We've been seeing reports for some time now that your arrest is likely imminent. What's the latest you're hearing? Well, Ian, there are 180 cases against me. Now, someone who till the age of 70 never had one case has now in the last few months 180 cases. And the whole idea is to arrest me in one of the cases. So far, they haven't succeeded because the cases are so frivolous and bogus that when they go to court, I, I keep getting bails. 
but I think uh, the 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 government's term ends on the 12th of August. So the whole idea is that I should be in jail uh, when the election uh, start. The elections are in October. So this is why uh, you know all these um, attempts to arrest me and get me out of the race are going on. And so what do you think the timing is likely to be sometime before the end of the government's term? But do you think an arrest may come in the next few hours or a few days? What do you know about that? Well, I'm, you know, I attend, I have to go from one court case to another almost on a daily basis. Uh, I have police inquiries. So I'm, most of my time is spent on this. But, you know, they have, they are now, the number of cases are increasing. They've, they've got certain judges in certain places which indicate that they are getting desperate. And plus, they've got now military courts. They've set up military courts. You know, I think that within the next two weeks, I expect to be behind, uh, behind bars. It is impossible for us in Canada to really assess the legitimacy of these charges. And so, you know, I've read people in Pakistan have, you know, some say these charges are frivolous. Um, and politically motivated. Some people say that they, some of them at least, deserve to be tested in court. Um, you clearly feel they're frivolous and politically motivated. Um, so, so how confident are you in the legitimacy of the court system to handle these cases? Well, in the past, Ian, let me just tell you that in the past, whenever we've had uh, a, a, a government falling and the prime minister goes into the opposition, Normally, they leave the country. I mean, the two uh, prime ministers, Benazir Bhutto and Nawaz Sharif, the moment they were out of power, they left the country two, two times. So this is the only time that the ex-prime minister is not leaving the country. And it's because I believe that whenever these case, cases go on trial, uh, you know, I'll be proved right. I mean, these are bogus cases. The only thing is that the, from the government's point, the reason why they are piling up these cases is because of the elections coming up. And what they hope is that they would get me, get a conviction in one of the cases, and I will go into appeal to the Supreme Court, but meanwhile the elections will be over and I would be disqualified for the elections. So this is why this whole exercise is going on. Pakistan is in, in a politically, strategically sensitive part of the world. It is a nuclear power. There are a lot of reasons for the West to want stability in Pakistan. What needs to happen for there to be that stability? Well, what are supposed to be the Western values? And Western values are democracy, rule of law, free speech, uh, no, uh, uh, you know, arbitrary punishments, Custodial torture, you know, the, all these things protecting the fundamental rights, the human rights uh, of the people. These are Western values. All these are being violated in Pakistan. We have no democracy now. We have an undeclared martial law. 10,000 of my workers are in jail today. Uh, all my senior leadership is either in jail or in hiding. Uh, and I have 180 cases and, and increasing. And worst of all, there were 25 people who were unarmed protesters who were killed on the 9th of May or 9th and 10th of May. No inquiry done on, on, on the killing of Pakistani citizens and about over 100 have bullet wounds. Now, this victimization that is going on, what we expect from the Western countries is to talk about these values. The only way we will have stability in Pakistan are free and fair elections. And unfortunately, all this effort right now going on by basically the establishment is not to have free and fair elections so that the biggest party, which has over 70 percent approval rate in the country today, that party is now trying to they are trying to dismantle it. So you you won't have free and fair elections. And if you don't have free and fair elections, you won't have political stability. And without political stability, I'm afraid we will not even have economic stability. Is there a role for Canada that you'd like to see this country play in terms of uh, achieving stability in Pakistan? All we want is that the 
that the Canadian uh, political leadership should speak about the this uh, dismantling of our democracy that is going on. I mean, all the values preached uh, by the Western countries, and especially when they criticize China or Russia uh, on human rights, all human rights are being violated. So that's all we want. We want them to speak about speak out against uh, the dismantling of our democracy and the violation of human rights. Mr. Khan, thank you very much for speaking with us tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ian. And that is, of course, just one perspective on what's happening in Pakistan. We will hear other voices as we continue our coverage leading up to the country's election this fall. As the war in Ukraine approaches one and a half years, NATO is watching closely. There is the possibility of a much greater threat in the air. David Common takes you inside the alliance's efforts to gather critical intelligence. The last ship covered under a UN broker deal to safely export Ukrainian grain through the Black Sea left the port of Odessa today. That deal will expire Monday unless Russia agrees to extend it. So far, it has not. Russian President Vladimir Putin has been calling for obstacles to Russian food and fertilizer exports to be removed. And Putin says his country has a sufficient stockpile of cluster munitions and, quote, reserves the right to take reciprocal action if Ukraine uses its own. Ukraine just got a delivery of the controversial weapons from the U.S. Putin says Russia hasn't used them so far, but humanitarian organizations say both sides have. Western allies have been supplying all kinds of military equipment to Ukraine since Russia invaded last year. They're also gathering crucial battlefield intelligence. Through surveillance aircraft, NATO has eyes trained on Ukraine, watching the war unfold. And last fall, David Common got rare access. We're getting ready for an early morning departure on board this NATO surveillance aircraft. With that dome, it can see hundreds of kilometers into the distance and watch what the Russians are doing in and around Ukraine on the land, sea and air. It's taken us months to get this access. Come and join us. As the sun comes up, the surveillance plane lifts off from its base in Germany on what will be a minimum 12-hour mission. They're bound to the very edge of NATO airspace, flying high above Poland, just outside Ukraine's war zone. The massive radar and surveillance tools are now switched on. Obviously, in Crimea, there is really, really a lot of activity. Much on this AWACS plane, or Airborne Warning and Command, is secret. We can't show it. We can't even tell you the last name of the surveillance operator, Portuguese Sergeant Joa. Basically everything that we are able to detect, uh, we obviously share it with the other two allies. What no one on this plane can officially say, but is widely known, is that some of those allies share this intelligence in real time with the Ukrainians, allowing them to respond quickly to incoming threats. Uh, this is what they call a sanitized version of this screen. It doesn't show everything that, um, that this aircraft can see. But we are told that it can do things like Russian fighter jets, certainly, but even Russian missiles, Russian drones, ships that might be out there. They can identify which ship using the powerful surveillance suite that is on board this aircraft and of course feed all that information, all that intelligence in real time to the ground. On camera, none of the crew can say exactly what they're detecting right now. The information relayed by an instant data link, nor will they describe specific events on the ground. They don't want the Russians to know what they know, particularly incidents where their surveillance was used by the Ukrainians. 
But off camera, some describe watching Russian radar signatures disappear after being engaged by Ukrainian jets and missiles. Early warnings, too, of incoming bombing or missile raids, watching Russian troop movements, and the exact position of Russian warships at sea. Senior Master Sergeant Alyssa is on the electronic front line, watching Russian positions, alerting others when Russian planes fly into Ukraine, and then seeing the response. When we watch the Ukrainian fighters taking off and protecting their airspace and going after Russian fighters, that was neat. Probably more than neat. It was. It was cool. They're fighting back and they're taking control of the country they love and they're pushing the Russians out. An alarm sounds unexpectedly in flight, only a simulation, but the crew treats it as real. A drill in the event of fire on board. These are tense times, especially as Russia rattles the nuclear saber, inviting a far more direct military engagement by NATO. An hour later, on the flight deck, pilots are engaging in a delicate airborne dance, a mid-flight refueling. Up there, is a U.S. Air Force tanker, a gas station in the sky. Carefully, the NATO plane edges up as a boom pole is extended from the tanker. For nearly half an hour, the gas is pumped. The pilots of both planes synchronized in their movements. After it's done, we catch up with the aircraft commander, an American, Major Wayne. After years of such work, including in war zones, he says this mission is something else. The big difference was uh, the adversary. So in the Middle East, they didn't have capable, um, a capable Air Force threat uh, that we were so concerned about. Uh, whereas here, uh, there is the possibility of a much greater threat uh, in the air. Russia doesn't particularly like this sharing of information, of intelligence, powerful intelligence with the Ukrainians. And so periodically they launch their own fighter jets, scramble them at this one. Um, and this aircraft sometimes has to take evasive action. It's not like they're shooting at one another, but does give you a sense of how NATO does have involvement really in the Ukrainian conflict. This aircraft is one of 14 in NATO's surveillance fleet, and along with similar planes operated directly by allies, they maintain a near constant watch of Ukraine's airspace. That crew comes from a multitude of NATO nations, a multi-year posting from their home countries. Uh, the person flying the plane right now is from Belgium, and back there, a Canadian. This is Captain Colin Wiley. As surveillance controller, he confirms and rapidly communicates inbound threats. Seeing things like, oh, disappearing at a low level, what does that mean? Probably okay. dropping yeah. bombs, right? They can't necessarily prevent them. That is the job of the Ukrainians. It is his first experience where all his training is playing out in reality on the screen in front of him. I wake up in the morning from my bed, <laughs> fly uh, orbits over here on the eastern flank, doing the job, and then I go back and sleep in my own bed at night, which is crazy for me, it's a crazy experience, and it also makes me think about those who are you know, involved in it who don't get to go to you know, a safe warm bed at the end of the day, it doesn't end for them. As the AWACS turns back to its base, another like it is already in the sky, taking up its station near the conflict, feeding a constant stream of intelligence as war rages in Europe. What an interesting story. That was David Common in the air above the Polish-Ukrainian border. And those NATO surveillance flights continue to monitor Russian military activity, even now as the conflict gets set to enter its 18th month. Trading up by getting into the skilled trades, the growing demand in the industry, and what's keeping some from breaking in. Plus. Hey, buddy. Where's mom? 
A chance encounter on the side of the road. What happens next is our moment. Since the pandemic, Canada has been facing a crucial gap when it comes to construction and manufacturing, with job vacancies hitting record highs. Some provinces are scrambling to recruit more young workers into the trades. But as Deanna Sumanag johnson explains, some hoping to fill those vacancies are finding barriers they weren't anticipating. University graduate Megan Donnelly left her career in insurance to pursue a job that would engage her mind and her hands. She's now a third-year steam pipe and welding apprentice, and things are going even better than she imagined. I'm not even at my full pay rate, and I'm already making the same as what I was making after 10 years at the insurance company. When it comes to the trades, politicians are promising a lucrative career you can get into straight out of high school. But many young people hoping for that career are encountering barriers trying to land that formal apprenticeship. Not all apprenticeships are alike. This head of training of a major trades union says aspiring tradespeople have to be aware of the mixed messaging put out by training programs and organizations. And I strongly suggest do the research, find out the outcomes. Sure, they can get you some work experience, but what you need is an apprenticeship contract. Under this centuries-old model of trades education, companies take on newbies to train with an accredited tradesperson. Their hours are logged and their progress monitored. At the end, they receive their license to practice as an independent journey person. You spend this large amount of money, there's an expectation that you're going to begin a career. But oftentimes, there's temporary placements for employment and there is no contract of apprenticeship signed. So can you show me what you're working on? Rebecca Cragness was once one of a few women, let alone indigenous women, on a construction site. Now she's a leader trying to make the industry more welcoming to everyone who wants to work in the trades. The um, traditional hours of work of an apprenticeship are usually early mornings, sometimes late evenings, and, and that can be tricky to navigate if you have a young child to take to childcare. So I, I feel like there are some opportunities for industry to maybe be more accommodating. We we'll make sure that they're all the same. The experts we talked to also agree, despite recent promises in Ontario that you can go into trades training straight out of grade 11, they suggest students still get that high school diploma, especially focusing on math and science, as measuring calculations and programming machines will be key to working in the trades now and in the future. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, here's an unusual sight a moose calf nestled up in a pickup truck. Mark Scage saw the animal on a BC road, felt it was in distress and in danger, so he decided to act. What came next was unexpected, and tonight it's our moment. Where's mom? As I was pulling up to this was a moose calf right on the shoulder of the road. I watched a couple of vehicles just about hit the calf. I just stopped, I opened the door, and immediately she was crossing the highway towards me, towards the pickup truck. I was kind of doing the commentary for it right there, um, asking her what was going on. You know, this isn't normal, it's not okay. You can't get in the truck. You can't just be out here all by yourself. I happened to glance over and there was a bear there. So I just went, oh, shit. just thought, well, you can't go in the driver's side. That's not going to work. So just kind of herded her around the passenger side. She was happy as a clam. Pretty glad she wasn't still standing outside with him. Well, you don't want to lick the truck. Come here. Her and I kind of bonded the whole way back because what else are you going to do, right? I'm, you're in my truck. I'm going to talk to you. I'll admit I didn't sit there for half an hour going over every scenario and who I'd upset or all. I just went, you came for help. I got to give you help. So as moments go, this one's a little bit unusual because uh, as heartwarming as you may find that video, the company he worked for has a very different view. Worked for as in they fired him. They said there were a series of events culminating in that which they say uh, violated their policies in terms of dealing with wildlife. They have other details that they've released, and if you're interested, I'm sure you can find it. I'll just leave it at the fact that that led to him, right or wrong, uh, to get fired. That is The National for this July 16th. I'll be here tomorrow night. Enjoy your Sunday evening.